This message is brought to you by House on the Rock Fellowship. We are a church that serves and cares for the Miami Valley region in Ohio. Before you continue, make sure to access the notes from our download section of our message page and have your Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. Duh. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Understand some of the things that are going on here in this passage. It says he happens upon this place. Kind of like by accident. Now that word for coming to, carry to, getting to, in the very beginning of that story, is the word to intercede. We've been learning that intercede has a lot of different nuance to it. Sometimes it means meeting, sometimes pleading, sometimes reaching, sometimes breaching. Okay? And he's reached a place. In the same way we're learning about heaven, earth. He just happened to be in this place. He is so bad off, he has to use a rock for a pillow. That lack of not planning. Okay, just, I gotta sleep with something. I'll stick my head on a rock. But in that moment, God meets him in a powerful way. Because it's not just any place. It's the place he's supposed to be in that moment. And God lets him see. The Almighty lets him see kind of the divine messenger system. Angels moving up and down, carrying God's messages, carrying God's will. And he looks through and he's able to see into divine space. And the Lord says, hey, I'm here. I'm here. And you're here. And I have something wonderful that I want to do. And I'm going to do. You, Jacob, have entered into the place of promise. In fact, everyone that I know, that you know, what we're going to do, we're going to bless them all and it's going to happen through you. We're going to bless everyone, Jacob, and I'm going to do it through you. And Jacob's like, kind of lucked out on this one. I could have all the hotels I could have gone to, of all the places I could have crashed, of all the waysides I could have pulled over, I lucked out and found this place. Well, from his perspective, it might have looked that way. From his perspective, just a coincidence. It's almost like, though, someone was behind the scenes bringing him exactly to where he needed to be to accomplish exactly what God was planning to do. You might have shown up here this morning and you just kind of happened. Got to go to church somewhere. We got to do something this morning. I guess we'll give this place a shot. I remember when it used to be a grocery store. I remember when it used to be a bingo hall. Oh, maybe you didn't know it. This is the house of the Lord. And he has something that he wants to do. And there is someone who brought you here. We're going to continue our series on prayer. I have to keep justifying the t-shirt, Terry, or my wife's going to make me wear real church clothes. We've been learning about what prayer is. What is it? Remember, it's pouring out our heart to God. Sometimes it's praise. Sometimes it's petition. Sometimes it's confession. Sometimes it's thanksgiving. 
And we've been really drilling down on the idea of prayer petition as interceding prayer. To intercede. Remember, sometimes it means to meet. I'm going to meet with God. Sometimes it means to plead. I'm pleading with God. It's very emotional. I'm pouring out my heart. Sometimes it means to reach heaven to earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's what Jacob was experiencing there. He came to a place. Sometimes it means to, do you remember? To breach. There are strongholds, strongholds of the mind, strongholds of the heart, strongholds of evil set up. And sometimes we're asked to and are given insight and we pray through those that his kingdom come and his will be done. And we do this all in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to continue this week and the next two, learning a little bit more about prayer. Next week, perseverance. Perseverance in prayer. You need to pray and not quit. Okay? Don't quit. The person that you're praying for, that situation that you're praying for, don't quit. There's a lot going on. And at the very end, we're going to talk about practical ways. But today, let's talk about the someone who also comes alongside of us to guide us, to pray with us, to pray for us, and maybe to pray through you. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, we're going to look at verse 26. If you have a set of notes, I might say some things that you want to write down. There's verses, there's passages. Uh, my mom is here. I've already preached once through the message. It was so confusing. She had to stay to see if I could get it straight this time. <laughs> some people after the last message were so scared, they might not even come back. Like, I can't believe he said what he said. And you're like, oh, what did he say? Oh, now you got to listen. Oh, oh, oh. Romans 8. Okay, set of notes. You have a Bible. Ryan's going to have the verse up so you can follow along. Uh, I want to read this one verse and let's open it up. Ready? Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Some of you are so excited right now. You're like, oh, what's he going to say? We're going to take this apart. We're going to, like it's an engine, we're going to open her all the way up. Okay, we're going to look at the pieces. We're going to make sure that we understand how things fit together. We're going to put the engine back together again because this is really going to start to drive your prayer life. Really going to start to drive your prayer life if you let it to places that you didn't even know was possible. Let me read it again. Likewise, Romans 8, verses 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay, let's, let's, let's open this up, okay? The Spirit helps the Spirit brings assistance if you're writing down things in your notes to help you remember. One of the things that the Spirit does is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, if you know it. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is the foundation of reality. This is the foundation of our faith. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We've talked a little bit about the Spirit before in the beginning of the series. Okay, the importance of prayer, why we as humans are called to engage in prayer. The Father wills something. The Spirit is ready to breathe life into it, but the Son has to speak it. Okay? All parts of the Godhead engaged in prayer. If you didn't understand anything that I just said, go to whoishouseontherock.com. If you need to be reminded, get caught up. Okay? But what does it mean that the Spirit helps, that he is assistance? That word helps is a compound word. It's three little words all mashed together to make one really big one. Okay? It means with, against, to take. That the Spirit is with us to go against, to take. 
that the Spirit joins with us, that there's something that we're going against, and with the Spirit, we're going to take a hold of it. We're going to take a hold of it. The word is also used in another place, in Luke chapter 10. It's an exchange between Martha and Mary and Jesus. Actually, Mary, Mary doesn't say anything. Okay, Martha, your younger sister, Mary, and Jesus. Uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, some of Jesus' best friends. Best friends. Anytime Jesus moves into the Jerusalem area, the metropolitan, he likes to hang out with his friends. Okay, Mary, Martha, in this situation, Jesus is there in the living room. He's teaching and Mary has decided, I want to sit at Jesus' feet. I want to learn. I want to learn something. I, I love what he's saying. I want to grow as a follower. So Mary sits. Martha, she got like all these charcuterie boards going. She's trying to get the punch bowl ready. She wasn't ready. She's made six runs already back and forth between their, her house and Kroger. Cause, and you know, man, like the kosher section is pretty small. So there's not a lot to work with. And so what did she say? Jesus, will you please tell Mary to help me? Help me. It's that word. I need her to join with me. There's a mess that I've come against. I need her to help me take a hold of it. Maybe your kitchen gets a little messy. Maybe your kitchen's perfect. Maybe you're like, you know, before we leave here, we got to clean the kitchen because if the fire department shows up, we don't want them to think we live like Bob's. Okay? My dad would say that all the time. I think he just said it to get us to do the job. Because like, the firemen are going to come. We're going to clean the house. Okay? You think of your kitchen, it's been completely trashed, or you're in the midst of a party, there's a midst of chaos, and I need the Spirit to come alongside with me with me to move against this chaos so we can take a hold of it. The Spirit helps, helps me. He comes along with me. He comes along with me to move against the chaos that I see, that I'm praying against, that I'm engaging in, to take a hold of it, to grab it, to do that which needs to be done. This isn't a 50-50. All right, I'll do this part. He does this part. No, we're, 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 working, on, we're working on this together. Uh, another way to understand it is, I know the destination that I'm supposed to go to. We talk about prayer. I taught this, especially you know, coming in Jesus' name. What is the Father's will? The Father's will is reconciliation and restoration. Reconciliation and restoration. Reconciled back in relationship to the Father, restored to the image of Jesus Christ. Those two things. How do I pray for anybody? Pray for reconciliation, that they know the Father. That the Father make himself known, that the Father show how much he loves them. It's crazy about them. That they are restored to the image of Jesus Christ. One degree upon another, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Okay. One degree upon another. I know the destination. The challenge is, sometimes I don't know what path to take. I don't know what the right path is for that person. Because if we're just talking about my house, right? Yeah, I live on the north end of Troy. That might be the destination, but there's a lot of different ways that we can go to get there, right? Same thing with the father. Yeah, you're right, Paul. Reconciliation, yep, restoration. But Paul, for that person, they need to take this path right now. Paul, not that path, it's that path. So the Spirit comes along to guide me. Why? Because I need to be aware of something. What? I'm weak. I'm weak. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. And what is, what is the weakness describing? We don't know what to pray for as we ought to. I don't know what needs to happen in the current situation. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do because of how well we know scripture, how well we know what's happening in a person's life. The Lord is guided, but sometimes I got no clue. I got no clue. I'm weak. The Apostle Paul talks about this from his own experience in his own journey. And I'd like to show it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I think this will really help some of you this morning. It's helped me.
2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 9. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 12. Make sure it's 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Towards the back of your Bible. Verse 7. Apostle Paul's talking about himself. So to keep me, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> keep me from talking. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Okay, just so we understand. Okay, so the Apostle Paul, given, shown amazing mysteries of God's plan and purpose. This is, this is the treasure trove that he ministers out of and loves out of and teaches out of. God showed him amazing things. And because of that, to keep him from getting conceited, to keep him from getting puffed up about himself, okay? A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So here's the Apostle Paul. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. He's preaching reconciliation. He's preaching restoration. He's ministering. He's doing all of those things. He's been shown so much. And all of a sudden, he receives a physical ailment, a physical infirmity. And interesting enough, the Apostle Paul has enough insight in this context that even though he says, I'm feeling the fruits of this physically, he says, I'm pretty sure that there is a spiritual root behind it. That there is a, a spiritual force of evil that wants to come against me, has come against me. It's a messenger of Satan, he calls it. And so what's he do? Well, who wants a thorn in the flesh? Right? Like, does, has anyone, do any of you want a thorn in the flesh? Anyone want a splinter? I mean, everything stops. You get a splinter, everything stops. Everything stops. Everyone stops. Especially if a guy gets a splinter. We're such wusses. And then she has to come along and she does... Why? Because you don't want it there. So the Apostle Paul, in the midst of great ministry, comes before God, hey, I'm experiencing this. I'm feeling this. Remove the thro this, this, this thorn, please. He asks once. Remove this thorn, please. He asks twice. Remove this thorn, please. Well, he's not praying correctly. Meaning the destination is right, but the path is wrong. Why? Because through prayer, what does he discern? God tells him, we love you. Paul, we think you're awesome. We think you're awesome. And we've shown you a lot. And we need you to continue to do a lot. But we also know your heart. And we don't want there to be any stronghold that Satan can grab a hold of. So to keep you from getting conceited, thinking too much of yourself, what's best for you is that we leave that thorn right where it is. Are you kidding me? So you're not going to cure the cancer. So you're not going to Answer that prayer. Paul in his wisdom. Paul in his wisdom discerns. Mm, I had the destination right. I had the path wrong. I had the path wrong. He's weak. But he also knows that in my weakness, what does he say? I'm strong. Now, there's just something about being human. It makes us Weak. We are weak. We come to the table weak. We like positions of power and postures of grandeur. And God says, no, to do this work, we got to be humble. 
You gotta be humble. In fact, Paul, we're gonna let this situation continue to help you be humble. To help you be humble. The psalmist said in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of us? We're a hot mess. What is the son of man that you care for us? I mean, we're lower than angels, but you have crowned us with glory. You've given us dominion. We are weak. Why would you possibly want to rule through something so foolish and self-centered as humans? Which is why sometimes we just don't even know how to pray. But there's so many different ways that this situation could go. We don't know what's best in that moment. Maybe you've been there. Let me illustrate. This last week, I was at the hospital seeing someone from our church family. I said, hey, handsome, how you doing, buddy? You look great. Body racked with weakness. A shell of what he was. How can I pray for you? Pastor Paul, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. I'm tired. Cancer riddled through his spine in constant pain, constant loss. Doctors can't figure out why certain things are bleeding that aren't supposed to be bleeding. He says, I'm ready to go home. My wife, she's my angel. I love her, but pastor, I'm ready to go home. How do you pray in that moment? I don't know what to pray. Is that what I'm supposed to pray? He's got the destination right, right? Here's a, here's a man reconciled to the Father, knows that Jesus loves him, walks in the love of Jesus. Jesus is working him towards restoration. And ultimately, right, when you step into glory, you are restored. But is this the path? So I did what all good pastors do in that moment. And I dodged it altogether <laughs> and quoted Psalm 23. Oh, the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He makes you lie down in green pastures and leads you beside still waters and restores your soul. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may you fear no evil, for he is with you, and his rod and his staff, they will comfort and guide you, and your cup will overflow, and may you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to pray. So it says, the Spirit helps me in my weakness. He intercedes. Notice that. It's not just Jesus interceding. Remember that? We pray in his name. It's not enough in God's amazing love and devotion to me and inviting me into the participation of restoration. It's not enough that one person of the Godhead is on my side. The Holy Spirit comes alongside and prays for me. The word intercede there, it's like super praying. It's pleading that the Holy Spirit is pleading. Verse 27, and it says it again, that he intercedes. Meaning he's meet, he meets with the Father. That the Father, 
who knows what is perfect and right and just and is inviting my participation in that, that the Spirit knows the mind of him who knows the heart. Okay, so the Spirit knows the Father, knows what the Father wants, and the Father hears the voice of the Spirit. Dude, you mean you can't get this wrong. I am immersed, baptized into a divine communication where it says that the Spirit groans with words that aren't even words, they're deeper than words. He intercedes. That means I don't need to ask saints to intercede for me. Like, why do I need to ask the saints? I got the Spirit. I don't need, hear me, I love you. I don't need to ask Mary to pray for me. Why? I have the Spirit praying for me. I don't ask angels to pray for me. You know why? I have the Spirit interceding for me. I mean, are you trying to tell me that that's not enough? Like, if I got the Spirit and the Son talking to the Father, I think that's got it covered. I think that's good. Right? But... <laughs> Here we go. You ready? Seatbelts. Ready? Ready? With groanings too deep. We, we, need to, we need to deal with this. But where are you at right now? Are you in a good spot? You okay? Okay? This, this should be exciting. You're like, you, should be like, you should be stoked up. Because like, all of a sudden the prayer life is just going to, all of a sudden things are going to start to happen now that you didn't think could possibly happen. I remember in the movie The Patriot, Mel Gibson's movie The Patriot. You guys ever seen this, this movie? It came out a couple decades ago. Okay? This is about the uh, battles in, in the colonies of Carolina during the American Revolution. Okay? And a lot of the guerrilla warfare that we as Americans would do and really make the, the Redcoats angry. Great movie, great movie. And you get to the end and it's the last great battle in the movie. And every now and then the camera shows you this, this young private on the line and he's just scared. He is so scared because right in front of him is all the Redcoats. General Cornwallis, all of them. And they are prime and they are in line and the drums are and the can is and he's just, he's petrified. He's petrified. And they tried to do a little bit of a workaround to draw and suck and envelop the, 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 the British to come forward. But eventually, they just, they have the numbers. The British have the numbers. And so the colonial army, they're on the run. They're all running the wrong way. And Mel Gibson is there and some of the, the other generals, you know, cry out to Mel Gibson's character. The line is faltering. The line is faltering. And you got to stay in line. You got to, got to push this forward. And you just see this picture, this young private, he's just hauling. Everyone else is hauling, so he's hauling in the wrong direction. And so what's Mel Gibson do? He bends down, he grabs the American flag and he just starts to wave it. And he runs up the hillside and he's waving it and everyone kind of sees this and they're like, oh, we're going, we're going. And he's just waving this thing at the top of the hill. Me, I want to treat, I want to retreat. I want to quit. And then the spirit comes along and say, come on, come on. We've got this. I'm with you. Let's move against this. Let's take this. As he prays with groans deeper than words. All right, what's that mean? How many of you think you know what it means? Oh, chickens, come on. How many of you think you know what it means? <laughs> Some of you are like, you yeah, know. All right. A lot of people think they know what it means. I want to share with you in as an amicably way possible what some of the main camps of interpretation are. And I'm going to share with you what we practice and where we are as a church family, okay? And maybe you're like, well, I had no idea. Well, it's all good. It's all good. There are those who um, they, as far as theology goes, believe in what they call cessationism that there are certain expressions and gifts of the Spirit that have ceased. Okay, after the apostolic age, after, since we have the Scripture, we don't need the Spirit to manifest in certain uh, more spectacular demonstrations, whether it's healing or words of knowledge, speaking in tongues specifically. 
okay? Speaking in tongues specifically. Like the Spirit doesn't do that, okay? Because we, we have Scripture, so why would the Spirit do that anymore? Okay, they're what we call cessationists. Uh, I did my undergraduate at a school that that was their position. Okay, so if you go to their theology classes, this is what they're teaching. This is what they're practicing. Okay, it's fine. I love them. I love them. Great people. Love Jesus very much. Very, very smart. Very, very, very smart people. You have another position. Okay, they're not cessationists. They're what you call continuists, meaning that even those, those more miraculous demonstrations of the Spirit have continued. Why? Because it's God. God can do whatever he wants. Okay, I'm not about to tell the Spirit he can't do something. Like, go ahead. Why, is that a good, why would you think that's a good idea? Like, no, we see the Spirit demonstrating in lots of different ways through healings and utterings of knowledge and wisdom and miracles and speaking in tongues. And some of you are already trying to get an exit plan right now. You're trying like, where's the door? Where's the door? Seatbelt. Hey, I love you. Really? Nothing? I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's all good. It's fine. We're good. You're okay. You're okay. Some of you are like white knuckling the backs of the seats. What's important to recognize in that position of praying in tongues, and I want to open that up to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. What does that mean? as they would see that playing out and practiced as the Spirit groans. Because this side, okay, the Spirit prays for, but the Spirit does not pray through. Okay? The Spirit prays for, but not through. Over here, the Spirit prays for, and the Spirit sometimes will pray through you. Okay? The Father who wills it, the Spirit ready to breathe through it and gives even utterance for the church family to speak the very things that are mysteries in the hearts and the minds of God, okay? Let me show you where that comes from, okay? Theologically speaking, because we want to root it in scripture and not experience, right? Scripture, not experience. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me show you some things uh, on where that interpretation comes from and how it's to be practiced if you practice it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a couple of things that we have to separate that sometimes fundamental Pentecostals don't separate and you need to or it creates a mess, okay? It creates a mess and God is a God of order, not chaos, okay? First Corinthians chapter 12, I'm gonna start reading in verse four, okay? If this is something that you've wondered about, make sure you write these verses down so when you call and ask me to talk, because if you haven't read and you wanna talk to me, I'll be like, go read, then we'll talk. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are a variety of gifts. Gifts, demonstrations of the Spirit. Same Spirit, varieties of service, same Lord, varieties of activities, same God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? The Spirit doing gracious things, manifesting gracious ways through the church. Father, Son, Spirit, all of them are involved, okay? To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. What he's talking about in this context, okay? Okay? is something that blesses everybody when it's being used, okay? This is for everybody. What he's about to say is for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit utterance of wisdom, to another utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy. That means preaching, proclaiming what I'm doing right now, okay? To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. Notice plural, plural, kinds of tongues, plural. That's important. To another, the interpretation of tongues, plural. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Okay, so he's talking about a healthy church family. And so the spirit will pour into individuals the capacity to do spiritual divine things. Maybe it's preaching, maybe it's teaching, maybe it's ministering, maybe it's a word of knowledge, uh, maybe it's speaking in languages that you haven't learned. Speaking in languages known languages that you didn't go to school for, okay? Remember, when this is coming out, there is no Google Translate, okay? So for the message to go from one person to another, the mind, 
has to speak to mind intelligently, you need to understand the message of the gospel, what God is asking you to do. What is truth? And if there's a language barrier, well, that's a barrier. And so the Spirit might empower one person to speak in this language or that language, or maybe it's Russian or maybe it's Japanese. It depends on where you are and who you're talking to. And the ability to interpret those. But who's it for? It's a language for learning that blesses everybody. It's for everybody. For the common good. For the common good. Okay? I, I use this same illustration in the first gathering. How many of you want to go teach the pre-K class right now? Debbie does. She's like, I like teaching the pre-K. Yeah? Is there? Yeah. You want to go teach the pre-K? How many do not want to go teach the pre-K right now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Linda does not you don't. Right. You're not gifted, not called. It's not a place where you thrive. But you know what? Those teaching over there right now, Allie's over there and Stephanie's over there, they are blessing that community and they are blessing all of us for the common good because they're using their gifts for the common good. Okay? Okay. If you get to chapter 14, he's going to talk about something a little bit different and he's going to bounce back and forth. It's real important. We talk about a tongue, singular, tongues, plural. Okay? Chapter 14. Stay with me. Okay? Stay with me. Seatbelt good? I love you. <laughs> Chapter 14, verse 2. Chapter 14, verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue, singular, speaks not to men, but to God. Oh, this is different. The other thing he was talking about, for the common good, for the communication of the message of the gospel, blesses everyone. Here, what do we call that thing when you talk to God? What's the word? What do you call that when you talk to God? It's called what? Prayer. Oh, so this is a prayer thing. When I talk to God, that's a prayer thing. Tongue, singular, speaks not to men, not common good, but for God. Is talking to God a good thing? Prayer a good thing? Yep, speaking in a tongue, praying in a tongue a good thing? Yeah, sure. What? Talking to God. Talking to God good? Awesome. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. The groaning beyond utterance that he might, she might not understand. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spirit-empowered thing. On the one hand, the one who prophesies a known language speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Well, the goal is to build up everybody. Is there anything wrong with, you know, edifying self? How many of you charged your phone last night when you went to bed? Right? Yeah, absolutely. You want your phone to work? Did you charge it? Is charging the phone a good thing? Did anyone call you selfish when you charge your phone? How dare you edify yourself like that? Seriously, charge your own phone. Seriously, self-centered Christian. The person who prays in a spirit, prays in the spirit, is building up themselves. Okay, hey, FYI, guys, you should pray for me. I got a long day. I have a long day. Okay, my day started at four. Praying for going over the message. I'm going to preach two messages, lead worship a couple of times after this. I'm going to do a, a life group for guests. Can't, I'm so excited. We have a boatload of guests that are getting together. It's going to be so fun. Road trips going to be awesome. I have some counseling sessions this afternoon. Okay. And then I'm going to teach catechism. I'm going to teach foundations. Love it. Great bunch. They're learning, diving deep into some beautiful things, memorizing scripture, memorizing truth. After that, I have an open house for guests. Okay. I will get home. I'll see my wife around 8 o'clock. When I walk in, battery, boo! It's empty. It's empty. But here's a mean by which a, spirit, a person can walk in the strength of the Spirit to edify. But keep going. Jump over to verse 14. Verse 13. If one speaks in a tongue, pray that you can interpret. Know what's going on with your mind. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my mind also. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a means by which, a grace by which, 
the Spirit can pray through me because sometimes I just don't have the words. Sometimes I don't understand. I just don't know. My mind doesn't know. Sometimes the Spirit might reveal to me, hey, Paul, this is what needs to happen. This is the path that we need to go down. But I'm going to still continually bring it before God. So maybe we're in worship and I'm over here and I'm praying and I'm praying with my mind and I'm holding up people and you've seen me do this. You've seen me do this. And sometimes I'll pray in the spirit. Well, Paul, we didn't know you were doing that. I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. Well, we didn't hear you. Wasn't talking to you. Who am I talking to? Talking to God. I don't know what needs to happen. As we think about the direction of the church or we think about this marriage over here that's failing or as we think about this addiction or we think about this crisis, I don't know. But I know I gotta pray. I know I gotta pray. Some of you have some questions. Some of you want some clarification. Call me up, write it down on a communication card. We can keep that communication going, okay? I respect both camps. I respect both camps. If you come from one of those particular camps, I ask the same thing of you that I ask of everybody at House on the Rock. Respect everybody else too. Respect everybody else too, okay? If you don't believe that that should be practiced, you'll probably leave and not come back. That's okay. If you believe that those things should be practiced, then practice it the way that it's supposed to be practiced, okay? It's not to show everybody how spiritual you are, okay? So what? What do we do? What do we do? The Holy Spirit's waving this banner. Sometimes I don't know the path that I should take. What should I do? Pray. Pray. Sometimes we're groaning. Sometimes we're crying out. Sometimes we're pleading. Sometimes we're breaching. But pray. Please pray. Please pray. If you get it wrong, the Spirit will bring you around. Hey, see it this way. No, this way. No, this way. Father's listening. Jesus interceding. Spirit enabling prayer. And then all of a sudden, you know what starts to happen? You look around and you're like, I think I'm in the house of God. God's like doing stuff. Like I had no idea where I was. I had no idea what I should do. All of a sudden God's like, yeah, but you prayed. And because you prayed, I can act. Because you prayed, I can heal. Because you prayed, I can serve. But God forbid, God forbid, you don't pray. Let me share with you one more story. Okay, this is in Luke 22. I love Peter. I am so thankful that Jesus brought Peter along on the journey because it makes me think that there's hope for me sometimes. Because Peter just says the dumbest stuff. But sometimes, dude, the guy walked on water. Have you ever walked on water? Okay, so, you know, give Peter his due. But in Luke 22, Jesus gives Peter insight into something and Peter misses it. He misses it badly, really badly. Jesus gives him the destination. Jesus gives him the path. Peter, Peter, going to bring a knife to a gunfight. Let me show it to you. I want to read to you some, okay? This is Luke 22. I'm going to start reading in verse 31. Let's listen to the story. Listen to this. See if you can see it in your imagination. Spirit help. Spirit help. This is after the, the Lord's Supper. This is, they're left the upper room. This is the night before the crucifixion. They're walking down through the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olivet. Jesus is having a conversation. He looks to Peter and he says something. Because they start to have an argument about who's the best. Because that's what kids do. Who's the best? Who's the most important? Jesus turns around in the car, leans over the back seat. Okay? Simon, Simon. You know it's bad when dad uses your name twice. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. Satan wants you. He has gone before the throne and asked if he can have the freedom to destroy you, to show how weak you really are like wheat, to let the useless chaff 
rise to the surface. Satan wants you. He wants your marriage. I'm talking to you. He wants your joy. He wants your career. He wants your kids. He wants your health. Satan asked for you by name. But Peter, I prayed for you. I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. You walk that good path. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. <laughs> Jesus, this is Pete. I'm your boy. I got your back. We'll fight together. We'll storm the gates together. You and me. Hmm. A little conceited. A little proud. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. So he's been told demonic forces are on the hunt for him. Look how they respond. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? Hey, when everything was great, you didn't even have to take a wallet. You didn't have to take your debit card. This is all good. People are just taking care of you. They're welcoming you in their house. They're giving you dinners. Was everything good? Did you need anything? No, everything was great. We didn't need anything. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it. Likewise, a knapsack. The one who has no sword, sell your cloak, buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. So he says, hey, it was easy before. It's getting bad now. It's going to get hard. Before, you didn't need to have. But you're going to move into a time of hostility now. And that's all they needed to hear. Oh, they're going to be a fight. And then he said, look, Lord. Here are two swords. And he says to them, it is enough. All right, so here's the question. What does that mean? It is enough. A couple ways that we could interpret that, right? Jesus, we got two swords. Two swords is all you need. That's enough. After all, I'm Jesus. And so like, I'll, I'll make them glow and there'll be laser beams that shoot out of the swords. So all you need are two. All we got, we got two swords. It's plenty. All we need are two swords. That's one way that you can interpret it, right? That's wrong. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. To put it in the vernacular, the, the colloquial of the time, it's Jesus' way of saying this. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Seriously. Stop talking. Stop talking. That's not what I meant. How do I know that's what it means? Look what happens next. He came out, verse 39, as was his custom in the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation, the trial. And when he withdrew from that about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven that strengthened him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And he's pleading now. We're pleading. Sweat become like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Why aren't you sharpening your swords? No. What did he say? Rise and pray that you don't fall into temptation. He tells Pete, Pete, it's going to get bad. It's going to get so bad. It's going to get spiritually bad. But this is a spiritual battle that we're about to go into. Okay? It's okay, Jesus. We've got two swords. 
We got two swords. Then Jesus goes off and he prays. He says to them, go pray. You need to be in prayer. I'm going to go pray. He's praying. He's wailing. He's pleading. He comes back to them and says what? Why aren't you praying? Why aren't you praying? Peter, why aren't you praying? I, I, brought, I, brought, my, I brought my sword. Pete, you brought a, a knife to a gunfight, buddy. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son with a kiss? And when those were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant, the high priest, and cut off his right ear. And Jesus said, no more of this. He touched his ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and officers to the temple and elders who had come against him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is a spiritual crisis, not a physical one. Verse 54. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. If you're Peter and you've been told what you've been told and you've seen what you've just seen, what should you be doing right now? And they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together. Peter sat down among them. A servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. This is the moment. This is the time that Jesus was getting get him ready for. Don't you understand? There's going to be a moment, Peter, in the next few hours when all the forces of evil want to show the world how useless you are. You pray. You pray. You be ready. You be ready. Because here comes the moment. But he denied it. Saying, woman, I, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. And Peter said, man, I'm not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another and said, you could have been praying. Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I told you to pray. I told you to pray. Why didn't you pray? And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Oh, he was packing. He should have been pleading. So he ended up running when he should have been kneeling. Oh, Satan wants your marriage. Oh, he wants your kids bad. Oh, he wants your joy. He's even asked for it. He's the Lord of the air. We gave up the words. Just pray. You don't have to have words. Just cry. Just groan. Just wail. And watch what might happen. You might find yourself on the run. But you also might find yourself in the house of God. And God says, you prayed. Let's change the world.
Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came, and that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life, and a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.